Scanning laser and obstacle detectors. Here we have a laser. Laser scans uh, an area and based on the rays, based on the beams that being directed, uh, being injected and being reflected, understanding the three-dimensional format of the of the um, area uh, in front of the the, um, the the laser. So we actually know the surrounding. We actually know, we get a picture, a two-dimensional picture of what is in front. It's for environmental mapping. It's a safety precaution applications when a robot actually is in move. And the robot wants to know that there are no obstacles. And if there are obstacles, to know the size, the measurements, and the position of the obstacle in order to bypass it. So we need a laser scanning in front of us to know exactly where we are and what kind of obstacle we have. And again, it's good for pattern recognition applications. And by having, uh, by, by integrating this kind of laser, scanning lasers, we maximize the working envelope. Because it's not only limited to the, the direct um, uh, uh, direction that we are going to, we can actually bypass it. So here we have a new type of working envelope that otherwise we would not actually reach. Now, the, the, the information on the right hand side tells us a little bit about some, some technical parameters which are very, very important. Detectable range is 20 millimeters to 5,600 millimeters. So we get actually a very, very large pictures, very, very details. Now, the way we get these uh, re uh, high resolution pictures is by having very fast scanning time. In a particular example is 28, 28 milliseconds per scan. So every 28 milliseconds, the laser scans. So as the robot moves, there's so many pieces of information getting every 28 milliseconds so the picture is a very actual picture, very accurate and very actual. It's as it is a real time picture, no matter where the robot is. 240 degrees scanning range and 0 .30, 0 0.36 degrees angular resolution. So if we divide 240 into, into segments of 0.36 angles, we actually see a precise picture of the object in front of us. And again, all this information is communicated back to the controller, either using USB or RS-232, maximum flexibility as the robot moves. Optical encoders. We talked about optical encoders when we looked at the motor in order to understand the position of the motor, how many rotations the motor did. Because the number of rotations, the number of degrees, the number of laps that the motor did, especially in, in analog type of movements of the robot's parts, will tell us exactly what is the displacement. Remember, analog displacement using uh, motors. And the optical encoder tells us exactly where we are in this analog range. Now, basically, as a definition, rotary encoder is a sensor or transducer used to convert the data of rotary motion into a series of electrical pulses, which are readable by the controller. The slotted disk, let's look at the disk on the uh, bottom right. It's basically a slotted disk. Black and white and black and white and black and white. I mean, black and air, black and air. And if these a uh, slotted disk rotates in between the printed circuit boards with the, with the <clears throat> component on it. And if the disk actually rotates inside e the, the two sides of the component, one of them is a transmitter, the other one is a receiver. And if the uh, rotating slotted disk is rotating in between them, it will cut the beam or it will not cut the beam block it or not block it, so that's counting pulses. And according to the speed of breaking the beam or not break, uh, breaking the beam, not only the speed and the number, we will know exactly how fast the motor rotates and how many rotations that the motor did 
And in case of a wire going to a finger, we know how much wire was actually released or pulled. The number of pulses that are being generated by the cuts of the beams between the transmitter and the receiver tells us the distance, the linear distance. Rotary sensing. Here we have a kind of a potentiometer. It's a multi-turn poten precision potentiometer that is laid on the motor axle and according to the number of rotations, so, many, so much uh, resistance is being generated on the pins of that particular uh, component. So we know exactly how many rotations the motor did. We know exactly how, uh, how long the wire um, it was pulled or was pushed. So there's another way of, of analyzing the number of laps or the number of rotations that the motor did and the linear transformation of the wire and the displacement of the, uh, the hands of the robot. Now, the voltage can be subdivided into 1024 segments per level. Let's imagine a complete 360 degrees rotation. If we divide this 360 degrees into 1024 segments, then every approximately one third of a degree is a specific voltage level. So it will be very, very accurately. So 1024 segments make the rotation of the motor very, very fine controlled. We will know every one third of a degree of the rotation of the motor where it is. So we can count the pulses. We will know the, the, dis, the linear displacement of the wire coming out of it being pulled or pulled because it's broken down to small segments. Soft pot rotary potentiometer. Another kind of an idea for cleaning and shining surfaces. The way it operates is by pressing down on various parts of the rotary dial, the resistance linearly changes. So we can actually put our hands on this sensor and depends where we are, there will be a different resistance at the output. And the output can range from so many ohms to so many months, depend on the specific uh, potentiometer that we, that we uh, uh, include, integrate in the system. And the way it's being done, it's a very fine, very thin variable potentiometer. Very, very thin. And we affect the resistance by pressing on the material. So the relative position on the rotary tells us exactly where we are. Very important from cleaning of lenses in the optics industry. Infrared temperature sensors. Again, non-contact temperature sensor. It's array of thermopile sensors suitable to detect thermal radiation and measurement of, of temperatures. Basically, it can be an array, meaning that we can have a map of the thing we test. An array in terms of the temperature, a temperature map of the object we test. Knowing exactly where there is a leak, knowing exactly if the temperature that being dissipated from an object is dissipated homogeneously. That's extremely, extremely important. Even automotive blind spot detection. An automatic, a, a car being manufactured, being metal, we would like to have an homogeneous uh, dissipation of heat in certain parts of the, of the metal. We will know exactly if there are blind spots there, if there are cracks, if the metallic part is homogeneously constructed or there are cracks. Wherever there is no, wherever there is a crack, no heat will be dissipated. That matrix will, dete will detect it and we will see a blind spot in the shape and the length and the position of the crack of the metal piece that we test. 
And this is something very, very uh, um, uh, important in terms of optical sensing. It's called the three axial tactile, uh, tactile optical sensing. It is to check uneven surfaces. The robot actually checking uneven surfaces to analyze how much uneven they are or how much they are according to what we want them to be. We have a robot here that has a tactile sensor, which is a dome, we can see it in the center. It has an XY stages, Z stages, rotary stages, illuminator to illuminate the light into the dome, we'll see it in a minute, and a force gauge, because that particular dome actually touching the uneven sur tested surface, and a motorized stage to change the position of the tested surface. Let's continue. Let's look at the two arms, the two fingers of a robot in terms of the three axis tactile sensing. We have here two fingers, finger number one, finger number two, each of which has two, three degrees of freedom. At the end, there are two tactile sensing. These two tactile sensors, they look at each other, they have a dome. Let's look to see how actually the work is being done. Now, what is this dome? On that particular dome, which is in yellow color, light is directed by an optical fiber. So the dome itself has um, some kind of a hollow area that light is inside. The dome is very bright, homogeneously bright by uh, optical fiber light coming from, uh, from the outside. On that dome, there is a matrix of, um, of uh, sensing elements that have fillers and they are attached to the domes. And there are matrix of such um, sensing elements. They are physically attached to the dome. Whenever we put, we take this dome and we touch an bo a, a body to be tested, some force is being applied by the body to the sensing elements. And because they are in a dome shape, they are located along the dome surface, they will be bent. Look at the picture on the, um, the, look at the sensing element in the center. Some force from the side is being applied. That sensing element is being bended. When that sensing element is being uh, uh, bended, it means that the homogeneous light is being disrupt, disrupt, disrupted. And when it is disrupted, we know exactly the coordinate of the points being disrupted. We know exactly the X and Y. We know exactly which sensing element got bended. That picture goes to a, a monitor. And we can see this monitor. Uh, it goes to a camera. This camera projects the, the, the picture on a monitor. And we see a matrix of gray spots. We know exactly which was bended, which was not, because each sensing element has an address across the dome. Let's continue. And here is a practical example. We want to test a PET bottle cup to see that the cup is uh, uh, all around as it was manufactured and it was placed and closed hermetically on the bottle itself. We have a torque sensor, a holder for the pet, and we have the two fingers on both sides of the cup itself. Now, the three axle force distribution directly obtained from the tactile sensor, as we said before. And not only the shape of the cup is being detected by the fact that which sensing element was bended and which was not, and get a map of the bended and unbended uh, sensing element. It's also good for slippering, for, for slippage, for sh because we apply shearing force, the robot rotates around the cup, 
So there is a shearing force around it. And because of the shape of the dome and the movement, the rotational movement, we understand if it is perfectly round and it is located in the right spot. So if there is no, uh, if there is slippage, there will be two additional uh, arms, grippers of the robot, that will close the cap to make it firmly. So we know by the shearing force, if the cap is hermetically closed, physically hermetically closed, or another gripper should come and close it and lock it. And here is a presentation of the matrix of the uh, sensing elements on the dome and the picture that it is being received by the camera and analyzed which sensing element was bending or not. Now, the contact areas of the conical fillers maintain contact with the acrylic dome all the time until they are getting bended. Where they are getting bended, the, the light which is across the dome is not homogeneous anymore. There's a black spot. This black spot is being um, uh, uh, taking pictures by the camera, being displayed, understand exactly, exactly where is this uneven and problematic shape. Let's see results. And here is an uh, a, um, exploded uh, picture of the cup contour and pin number two and pin number three and the actual result of the contacts of the contacts between the, bend, the, the sensing elements and the cup contour. We can see the, that in this particular case, there is no matching between the cup and the movement of the robot itself. Number one, we can calibrate movement of a robot. If we take a cup, which we know ahead of time that this is a reference cup purely circular, then we can place it and make the, ro the, the robot walks around it with the fingers, with the three axis tactile optical sensing. And if we get such a result that then we know that the movement of the robot is not calibrated, is not exactly following the cup contour or the reference cup contour. Here we have two uh, coordinates and these are, they are in millimeters. And we can see that there are portion of millimeters of offsetting between the movement of the dome and the cup contour. So either we check if we have a calibrated robot, knowing that the rotational movement of the robot is a reference one, and we want to check cup contours in this particular example or any uneven shape, then we can see that there is a problem with the cup contour. But if we know that we want to calibrate a movement of the robot against a reference cup contour, then we know exactly how to adjust and what to correct in the robot mechanism in order to follow exactly the contour. There's a better picture, better, better uh, um, a test result of the test. We see here that pin number two and pin number three have one specific point of connection between the contour and the robot movement, the dome. And there's a problem in this elliptical, blue elliptical shape, where we see that the movement of the robot getting further away from the cup. So when we want again to calibrate the robot, what we do is we take a reference cup contour, knowing that this is a circle, one pure circle, 100 degrees complete circle. Robot will move around it. The, the distance between the bended and unbended um, uh, 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 sensing elements and the cup contour will provide such a picture, meaning that there is no uh, rota pure rotational movement of the robot itself. And 
there's another technique how to uh, analyze the position of a robot compared to some reference lighting beacons coming from the external areas around the robotic system. Let's look at polarizing light for beacons and polarizing sensors for detections. Now, as a general statement, most light sources, any light source, emit lights that wiggle in all orientations. That up and down, side by side, diagonally, in all orientations. That particular effect is called unpolarized light or non-polarized light. Now, if a linear polarizing light, a filter is set up vertically, then most of the up and down wiggle light will go through and most of the side by side wiggling light will get blocked. We can see it very clearly in the picture. The picture on the right, that vertical filter will pass only the ver vertical um, uh, elements of the light beams. The horizontal one will not. So again, we have a filter, either it's vertical or uh, horizontal oriented in order to block part of the beam and direct either vertically or horizontally the beam just behind that filter. Now, a vertical beacon can be detected by the sensor with vertically oriented film, but not horizontally oriented film. Now, if a piece of vertically oriented polarizing film in place in front of a light sensor, then the vertically oriented light produced by the beacon can pass through and be detected by the sensor. So we split between the horizontal, uh, the horizontal and the vertical, and then there will be another sensor that will sense where the horizontal come, so the robot know exactly where it points it to. And here we can see the split. We have two light sensors, one behind each uh, filter, and one will actually detect the light beam, the other one will not detect the light beam. These two filters are 90 degrees one to each other, one is blocking the beam, the other is not blocking the beam, so only, only the vertical um, beam, the vertical components of the beam will pass through the vertical filter and will be detected by the uh, detector, the sensor. And here we have two degrees, two stages of filters, polarized filters. First of all, we have the light sensor, the, the, the LED. And the LED is a non-polarized light. Goes to horizontal um, filter. The filter out the vertical uh, components of the beam and just pass through the horizontal beacon. And the horizontal beacon will go to a second uh, stage of filters, one vertical and another horizontal. It's a second degree, second level of, um, of a filter. So the light sensors, the two light sensors, the two light detectors will give us a definite um, result. One of them will say detect, the other one will say no detect. So sometimes in order to have the complete split between the vertical beams and the horizontal beams, we need two degrees of polarized uh, film, films, which are basically filters for the sensors to be able to definitely say, yes, I can see the energy. No, I cannot see the energy. And the sensor that sees the energy, that means that the robot actually is looking toward it. So we get a feedback of the position of the robot itself. Now, a non-polarized light source produces the same direction, the detection levels in both, both the vertical and the horizontal. The same levels. So, if we put two, two filters, two polarized filters, one of them is vertically, the other one is horizontally, 
they both, both sensors, both detectors will say, yes, I do detect. So basically, we need to have either one different than the other or two degrees. If both sensors detect energy, that means that the robot is not looking at the object that is looking. That means that the information goes back to the computer, cannot allow, can, is not sufficient for the computer to know exactly where the robot is looking at. The robot needs to send information you, by means of two sensors. One of them says, yes, detect. The other one says, no, detect. Yes, energy, no energy. Back to the computer, so the computer understands exactly where the robot looks at. If both detectors says yes energy, that means the robot is, is not looking at a light source. So the computer does not know exactly where the robot is pointed at. Now to summarize all this, it's a very, very fine and interesting technique in order to uh, understand and analyze positional um, position points. Uh, of the robot. That's to summarize that. If both sensors detect the same amount of light, the robot is not looking at the, team, at the beam. It can be ambient light, but it's not looking at the beam. If a vertical sensor sees a lot more light, the robot is looking at the vertical beacon. So there is a light source having some filters, and if we detect light, we know exactly where the source is. We know exactly what we're looking. And the other way around, if the horizontal sensor sees a lot, of, a, a, a lot more light, the robot is looking at the horizontal beacon. So we can have another light source in a different XY position, but the filters will be rotated 90 degrees. And if the robot will, will look at it and receives energy, that will know exactly where is the light source sending this information to the controller? The controller will know exactly where the robot is looking at. We know exactly the point where the robot is in order to tell it, direct it, command it to go to the next point. Sensor system in navigation applications. Now, a navigation system basically plays an important role in mobile robots. Because mobile robots moving from one place to another, they need to have a reference point. They, it's very difficult to generate a reference point because of their movement, so they actually attach to the global point. And a robot, mobile, robot must interpret its sensors data to extract environmental information with which the mobile robot can determine its position. So knowing where I am, I can do it only when I look where I am in a global environment. So I need to have an environmental information, kind of reference information, and from there I will know exactly where I am. And after a mobile robot can localize its position, it must decide how to act to achieve its purpose. Now once I know where I am in relation to the global area, now I know what should I do next. Next, there is an algorithm and the algorithm, I can actually activate this algorithm which will control the drive systems. But the only way I can tell where I am is not by looking at myself, by looking at the environment around me, having sen have a reference sensing inputs. And by connecting to every one of them, Globally, I know exactly where I am positioned. And this is a very, very interesting technique for indoor localization of intelligent mobile robots. Cleaning vacuum cleaners, robot vacuum cleaners, for example, one of the application. Now, it, the way it works is that a particular robot has an IR infrared projector the shoot of infrared rays at the landmark on the ceiling. Now on that ceiling, there's a matrix of landmarks, land, makes it, matrix of reflectors. They are hidden on the ceiling. 
Their pictures are somewhat are in the top right. There, there is a set of landmark sensor uh, reflectors in the ceiling. And whenever the robot is injecting an infrared, um, uh, projecting an infrared uh, energy up to the ceiling, depends where the robot is, certain energy will come back, providing a specific picture. Every place the robot is, there will be a different picture coming from the top. That particular picture is being received by uh, matrix receivers within the robot. And robot will know if I, if I get picture uh, the top one in the corner or I get a picture which is uh, uh, the one behind it, a different type of matrix, different types of uh, 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 white um, dots. And that different matrix of white dots that, we, that I get every place I go, I know exactly where I am. I have a matrix of, of reflectors on the ceiling. I inject energy up. I get some pictures back to me, reflected. I know exactly based on the picture where I am. And it's basically not coming from a one specific landmark cell. It's a combination of cells. I analyze based on certain cells in the ceiling to know exactly the position that I am in.